this eraser to my whiteboard in my office, it works perfectly. <laughs> so I think the surface here is defective. Uh, I mean, some surfaces just uh, uh, don't, uh, some surfaces just get uh, uh, dirtier than others. They've learned this with refrigerators. I mean, refrigerators used to, you know, fingerprints used to show up all the time. They, they learned how to put exactly the right uh, coating on refrigerators that, that you now see, don't see your fingerprints there anymore. It's a meta surface, right? They, they've, found a, they've found a way to prevent you from erasing whatever is written here. Okay, so which did we decide was better? I think the blue is slightly better. So let's call this phase conjugation. By degenerate four wave mixing. Here, degenerate means all frequencies equal. And as you maybe know, in the English language, degenerate has another meaning as well. I found it fascinating to go to a good dictionary and trace the historical evolution of the word degenerate to see why it actually makes a little bit of sense how the word ended up having these, uh, these two very different meanings. Uh, I might forget what it was. It, it, it didn't make a lot of sense, but it, was, it made fascinating reading. But you had a real question. <laughs> Google's wonderful for things like that. What yeah. happens in transmission, like anything Well, it's called a phase conjugate mirror. That's the first comment. Uh, Does that mean like especially... No, but there's forward phase conjugation. Like in, in a laser, you need the light to leave the cavity at some point. That's why I drew it the way I drew it, by the way. So it leaves through... Through the, the conventional mirror. Uh, uh, I drew it... Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't work the other way. Because it's the aberrated wave that's at the other mirror. Uh, So I don't know the answer. I, uh, people have worked on this. So, I mean, you can define the phase conjugation process in the forward direction. Uh, that's often, well, that, that does not lead to aberration correction, to do phase conjugation in the forward direction. Uh, of course, this same distinction shows up in holography, that uh, in a hologram, oh, one of, the dif one of the diffracted waves is the phase conjugate of the other, and things like that. So uh, these things were not unprecedented when they were first discovered. Oh, so who discovered it? Uh, Hellworth. But by the way, uh, phase conjugation by SBS, this was discovered by Boris Zeldovich. Any Russians here? So uh, at that time in the Soviet Union, well, first, at that time it was the Soviet Union, and at that time uh, the convention was that all the authors put their names in alphabetical order. Let's just say the Cyrillic alphabet is very different from the uh, Latin alphabet because uh, the letter we call Z is at the very front of the alphabet. So, so uh, Zeldovich got his name first on this paper and he is credited then with discovering SBS phase conjugation. He tells me that he was not the one in the laboratory who first made the discovery. But on the other hand, 
uh, Boris was the one who figured out how it worked. I mean, so, so he came up with the conceptual understanding of why SPS leads to phase conjugation. Okay, so you'll be happy to know that he anglicized his name. He removed that funny little mark on the L about 10 years ago. So, so I said, Boris, Boris, you changed your name. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, people like Senia have explained this to me, that it's Zeldovich, and uh, this is Zeldovich, and this is Zeldovich, or, or something of that sort. So. Okay, so degenerate four-wave mixing. Uh, so here's the idea. You take a chi-3 material, I'll define the z-axis like so, and z equals zero, z equals L, and now you apply two input waves, I'm sorry, three input waves to the material. This one, A1, is what I'll call a pump wave. This one I'll call A2, and it is also a pump wave. And this wave here I'll call A3, and this is a signal wave. So by means of a four-wave mixing process, this and this and this interact with one another to form an output wave that I'll call A4. And I'll call this a conjugate wave. By the way, there's still some question as to who came up with this first, Hellworth or Yariv. They are both in Los Angeles. Uh, I think it was Hellworth. Well, I mean, I know that his paper came out first. Uh, and the uh, conceptual description of Hellworth was very different from that of Yariv. So, uh, so it seems as if they both came at this from a different direction. Uh, Yariv likes to tell the story that he discovered phase conjugation because he was sitting on the beach watching the waves come in and wondered why the waves come in and didn't go out. So uh, that's his story. I like to say I, never to his face. Maybe you were sitting on the beach reading Hellworth's paper. <laughs> Please don't repeat. And I'm being recorded too. <laughs> uh, these these people are all my friends too, which makes it either better or worse depending on your perspective. Okay, so uh, uh, so how do you work this out mathematically? Well, E. Of R and T is E1 plus E2 plus E3 plus E4, and E sub J of R and T is equal to A sub J of R e to the i k sub j dot r minus omega t. Note, not omega sub j because all four waves are at the same frequency. Uh, we really no. so uh, so we now ask what is the nonlinear polarization and this will be six epsilon zero 
times chi three E one E two E three star. No. Well, and by chi three, I mean chi three of omega equals omega plus omega minus omega. Uh, I should say this differently. This is one contribution to P non linear. So, of course, in uh, let's recall that P non linear in the time domain is epsilon zero chi three e of r and t cubed. Now, probably, oops, crucially plus complex conjugate, which I left out before. Now, if you really want to, you have my permission to take this, expand it in terms of this, raise it to the third power, and see what you get. Better is to believe me that one of the contributions to P nonlinear is the one given here. And since chi 3 is omega plus omega minus omega, you know that one of them needs a complex conjugate and the other two cannot have a complex conjugate. So this is the one that I want to isolate our attention upon. Why? You can almost see it already. You, you can see where this is heading. I want to form the phase conjugate of the signal wave. So I want to take the part of the nonlinear response in which E3 is, is complex conjugated. Okay, we could all go home now. I mean, uh, I mean uh, that's, the po uh, that's the point. And, and now we have to work through the grubby details, but, but, uh, but that's the point. Uh, OK, so this is one contribution to P nonlinear. Uh, and I'll write it differently. Or P nonlinear is 6 epsilon 0 chi 3 A1, A2, a3 star e to the i k1 plus k2 minus k3 dot r. And now, well, I drew the picture this way, but now let's assume that a1 and a2 are counterpropagating. And what I mean by counterpropagating is that K2 is minus K1. And then, of course, if K2 is minus K1, they cancel, and that this term here becomes just E to the minus I K3 dot so the nonlinear polarization is propagating in exactly the same direction that you wanted the conjugate to come out as. In order for this to be a phase conjugate mirror, you want A4 to come out in the opposite direction as A3, and you want it to have the proper wavefront structure. So by choosing these to be counterpropagating, uh, this fulfills uh, all those requirements. Uh, 
So let's just write it out explicitly then. P nonlinear is six epsilon zero chi three a one a two a three star e to the minus i k three dot r. Uh, Another way to say this is that this is phase matched to the A4 wave. Now we want to derive our couple of amplitude equations. Amp equations uh, and let's make another assumption assume that a1 and a2 are strong in the sense that they are undepleted by the interaction, and as a technical detail, let's assume that they have the same intensity. This is so that cross-phase modulation doesn't wreck the phase relationship between the two of them. By the way, in the unlikely event that you want to know the details, you can turn to the book. Uh, because first I don't make that approximation and things go haywire and, and then I say, well, but look, if, if the intensity of A1 and A2 is the same, then, uh, then that does not uh, break, break the uh, phase matching condition. Uh, so under these conditions we can derive a coupled amplitude equations we find that dA4 dz is minus i times 3 omega over nc chi 3 a1 a2 a3 star. Similarly, well, if A1, A2, and A3 can generate some A4, then uh, for self-consistency, we have to allow A1, A2, and A4 to modify A3. So similarly, we have an equation that dA3 uh, dz is equal to I, without the minus sign because it's going in the opposite direction, I times 3 omega over NC, chi 3, A1, A2, A4 star. These are fairly easy to solve in many uh, different limits. Which, of course, we will do next. Uh, let's assume initial conditions. Some people say these are initial conditions, not boundary conditions, to maintain a distinction. So let's assume that A3 of 0 is arbitrary, but not equal to 0 
and that A3, A4 of L is equal to zero. So this is sort of the natural boundary conditions. We want this to act as a mirror, not what we call a one-way mirror, that you can sort of sneak through it, you can peep on other people. So, so, uh, so you don't put anything in from the back. Uh, uh, you only apply the signal wave and then you see what's going to happen. Uh, so you solve. And in truth, it's not a lot of fun to solve it. No, maybe it is. It's a lot of fun to solve it. I will not deprive you of the joy. <laughs> I will let you go home and solve this. Uh, so here is the solution that A3 star of z is equal to the cosine of kappa modulus z minus l over cosine kappa l a3 of 0 star and that a4 of z is minus i no minus i kappa okay this is the phase but i like to write it this way uh, i mean you stare at that and there's no there's no uh, there's no question in your mind that this is the, some overall phase. There are other ways of doing argument and whatever. Then I have to remember what argument means. Uh, sine of kappa z minus l over cosine of kappa l times a3 star of zero. Okay, so these are the solutions. Uh, oh, and here kappa is equal to three over nc chi three a1 times a2. Now, Let's assume that chi 3 is a real number. If chi 3 was complex, that almost certainly the material would be absorbing, partly absorbing, and then we would need to add uh, absorption terms here. So just writing it in this way, we've made the implicit assumption that it's a non-absorbing material. So we now write the output fields. That will be A3 star at L. And this is A3 star at 0 over cosine of kappa L. Well, cosine is either 1 or smaller than 1. So we see that the signal wave actually gets amplified as it passes through the material. And let's see, A4 of 0 is I kappa over kappa times the tangent of kappa L times A. 3 star of 0. Uh, so it is generated but then you remind yourself that the uh, tangent
function uh, can become infinitely large. Infinite output is predicted for kappa L equals pi over 2. So, what in the world is going on here? we can ask for an energy level description. So there are two dominant terms. One term is A1, A2, A3, and A4. And we'll put the star there just for fun. And you say, ah, oh, now I understand. The process involves taking one photon out of each pump wave, amplifying the field that's already present, and then generating this field A4. So in order to generate, it's just like uh, parametric amplification that we talked about earlier. In order to generate in order to generate this field, you have to amplify whatever field was already present here. So uh, that is one contribution. And there is another contribution. Which we can write like this. A1, A3 star, A2 and A4. So we can call this the two photon contribution. And we can call this the one photon contribution. And what these terms mean, it's the same thought we did earlier in the semester. Let's draw our dotted lines. If there's a real level of the atom here, you would expect this contribution to become very important. Similarly, uh, I drew this wrong. A1, uh, A2, A3 star. Similarly, if there's a real energy level here, you would expect this contribution to become very important. Okay, so we have looked at this now from uh, from a formal point of view. Uh, we, we solved the wave equation with a nonlinear polarization. But now let's go back to, now that we've done the mathematics, Let's go back and take a look at our starting equations. See, even with water, it won't come off. Now, there's another way to understand this, which I will call the, let's put it here, the grating picture. Ooh, we just talked about this, and not everybody loves the grating picture, right? Uh, we, we established that. Did he leave? <laughs> okay, so the rest of you maybe love the grading picture. 
<laughs> okay, so th there's an intuitive way of understanding this. You, uh, we did it mathematically first, but, but, but here's another way of understanding this. Let's draw, well, let's draw the picture here. Now look, these two waves can come in and form a grating that looks something like that. Then this wave comes in, reflects off of that grating to produce the output wave. And using the same thought as before, you can convince yourself that this grating is always oriented properly, that it will def uh, diffract this wave into this direction. But, ah, wait, 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 let, let me, sorry, let, let me, let me improve on my picture a little bit. So the two blue waves uh, represent two of the waves. Then the other pump wave comes in from this direction, diffracts off, and leads to the output wave. But there is another contribution. And the other contribution is that the signal wave and the backward going pump wave interfere to form a very fine pitched grating. And then the other pump wave comes in from this direction scatters off of this grating and ends up in this direction. Okay, so there are two contributions. And now you go through the equations in the book and look at this very carefully and you will find that For pure chi 3, both make an equal contribution. That's the first point. Uh, but if the gratings and become washed out. The large period grading becomes most important. Now, how could the grating get washed out? Well, for example, Doppler motion. <coughs> Doppler motion and an atomic vapor. So if a uh, If an atom gets excited here and then uh, drifts to a new location, uh, that's going to wash out the grating. So the, the atoms are going to be strongly excited at the maximum intensity point, but then if they diffuse to a region of lower intensity, that tends to wash out the grating and makes this grating much less important than this grating here. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by pure chi 3. Does that mean no like, first order effects or fully real? Like, I missed it in passing. <coughs> okay. For, not, 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 as, not, not as in real versus imaginary, but um, atomic vapor is not
purely local, let's say. Now, uh, so there's enormous room for debate here. Some people would say that uh, if it's not purely local, it's not chi-3. <laughs> so I guess all through the semester, we've assumed that chi-3 nonlinearities were material properties. Uh, uh, whether an atomic vapor is a chi-3 nonlinearity or not is up for discussion. Well, it depends on what you mean. So when you write a paper, you should uh, you just have to tell people what you mean. Uh, one solution being to call it an effective chi-3 nonlinearity, which is a trick I use very, very often. I mean, nobody can challenge that. Uh, uh, because, any f because the definition of effective chi-3 is even more nebulous than the definition of, of a chi-3 nonlinearity. Uh, Okay, maybe that's enough on this topic. If you look at the book, there's a section on the polarization properties of phase conjugation. Uh, so, many people build phase conjugate mirrors, I'll call them scalar phase conjugate mirrors, that they correct the wavefront, but that they do not correct for polarization distortions. So you know that a metal mirror turns right-hand circular light into left-hand circular light upon reflection. An ideal phase conjugate mirror will take right-hand circular and it remains right-hand circular uh, upon reflection. And is there an easy way to describe this? Uh, I think Samuel described, uh, gave the lecture on uh, polarization properties of nonlinear propagation with the Maker and Terhune notation of the A type nonlinearity and the B type nonlinearity. Let me remark in passing that if A vanishes identically, you always get polarization conjugation. A tidbit for cocktail parties. You walk out to people. Hey, did you know? Did you know that if the uh, that if the, do the the dominant contribution A is usually the dominant, if the dominant one vanishes, you're left only with the B-type nonlinearity. That then you automatically get perfect uh, polarization conjugation. So uh, that is worth saying. And the other is that if these two pump waves are circularly polarized but counter-rotating. Uh, uh, so, uh, so one is right-hand circular, the other is left-hand circular. Uh, then this also leads to perfect polarization conjugation. And I think that there is a uh, so let's not talk about handedness. Let's talk about the angular momentum. So if this carries plus one unit of angular momentum and this one carries minus one units of angular momentum. Then you come up to a state here, and then if this wave here has a polarization unit vector sigma, this one has to have a polarization unit vector sigma star. And the easiest way to, to think of this Think of this as a j equals zero state, and this is a j equals zero state. 
So to go from here to here, the two input photons have to carry equal and opposite angular momentum. If they carry equal and opposite angular momentum, then this photon has to carry the opposite angular momentum of this photon here. You sometimes wonder why you write books, right? That's five pages, and I just told it to you in three minutes. Okay, uh, next topic. Uh, and again, this is moving off in a different direction. Uh, Multi-photon absorption. Let me start off just by defining what I mean by multi-photon absorption. You can have one photon absorption. You can have two photon absorption. You can have three photon or more generally, or more generally, you can have N photon absorption. Now, if you want to do some high-intensity laser physics, uh, you, you might want to know, well, how do I calculate these things? How, how do I estimate the n-photon cross-section or the n-photon transition rate? Uh, well, first of all, let me tell you how you don't want to do it. Uh, two photon absorption is described by the imaginary part of chi three of omega equals omega plus omega minus omega. Well, we already know the quantum mechanical expression for this, so all you have to do is take the imaginary part and you're done. But now you say, oh, but we agonized over that. Uh, I mean, there's, there's like 50 terms in, in the general expression for chi-3. Uh, so m maybe this is not the best way to describe two-photon absorption. And then, what about n-photon absorption? The last thing in the world you want to do is to calculate the most general form of chi n and take its imaginary part. So, uh, so, so there is a much easier way to do it. This is the hard way. This is the easy, or at least easier way. Yes? Yeah. So n photon absorption should be chi n plus one. Uh, I forget. Let, let's do three photon. Uh, 
omega, oh, I think so, yeah, equals omega plus omega plus omega minus omega minus omega, so it's chi five. Okay. Now, what is that? Uh, uh, 2n plus 1? If this is... Yeah, that, that, <laughs> I just can't write as fast as you can talk. <laughs> uh, by the way, this is a great final exam question. So I feel really bad for the people who left class early today. Uh, no, because yeah, yeah. it's not so obvious, is it? Uh, well, it's two n minus one, but I had to work it out. So you can memorize the answer; you can work it out. It's not hard to work it out if you understand what's going on. So why do people even care about multi-photon absorption? Uh, here, l let me just give two very simple reasons. One is spectroscopy. Let's say you have an S state here, and let's say you want to have an S state here, and you want to know what is the energy separation between these two states. Well, selection rules say that you cannot do a one photon transition between S states. This is a forbidden transition, as they say. So instead, you'd have to use two photon absorption to study a transition between an S state and another S state. Uh, Another one is microscopy. I think there's a picture of this in the book, courtesy of Watt Webb. So let's say you take a dye solution and you focus your laser beam into it uh, and in if you have one photon absorption, I'm going to be more careful. This is one photon absorption leading to fluorescence. So this might be something like this to this and then a rapid decay to this, and then fluorescence. A very, very common uh, type of interaction. So two photon absorption, rapid relaxation to this level, followed by fluorescence to this level here. Uh, so if you do this with two photon absorption, and you look at the fluorescence. You see this little spot here. So people who do two photon micro, I mean, you can look in, you, you can look inside of materials. Uh, you, you can uh, look inside of materials and your signal comes from a very small region not from a very large region. So you can isolate longitudinally much better if you use two photon absorption. Okay, so that is the motivation. Oh, I said there's an easier way And this is to use Fermi's golden rule. How many of you are familiar with it? 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one of my professor friends said, "Hey, you got to teach this because nobody cares how to calculate chi three using the density matrix theory." Bob, you're the only person in the world who cares about that. But Fermi's golden rule. I mean, this is something really important. So, so make sure you include this in, in your lecture. So we're going to do a quantum mechanical calculation. And what you're supposed to take away from this is that even though it's late in the day, you're tired, this is still much easier than the calculations we had done earlier this semester. Uh, so uh, we're going to calculate multi-photon transition rates. So we'll start with the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation, which I'll write as IH bar partial psi of R and T with respect to T is H psi of R and T, and we'll take H and represent this as H0 plus V of T. Same notation as in earlier lectures. This is the atom, I'll say it's the free atom, and this is the interaction. of the atom with the laser beam. And we will take V of T as before to be minus mu times E of T, where mu is minus E times r, because in concept, r is an operator. In the coordinate representation, the operator r is just the coordinate r. But, uh, but of course, you, 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 could, you could be perverse and insist on working in the momentum uh, representation, and then r would be a differential operator. Uh, We'll take the applied field to be E of T is equal to E, E to the minus I omega T plus complex conjugate. And we'll assume that the field is switched on at time T equals zero. So this is also very different from the calculation we did earlier. We assume that the field had been on for all time, and we're asking, uh, after it settles down, uh, what, uh, what is the oscillating dipole in the atom? Now we're explicitly trying to determine the, uh, the, 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 the transient behavior. So we'll represent the wave function psi n. If this sounds familiar, it's supposed to sound familiar, although in about 10 equations we move off into a different direction from before. U n of r e to the minus i omega n t, where omega n is e n over h bar. Uh, I 
problem is not explicit enough. Let's assume that we can represent this being tedious, but I want to get the logic straight. Uh, if you don't get the logic straight, then it's just a jumble of, of equations on the board. So this is one of the energy eigenstates. Take this as a trial solution. Introduce it. Uh, in the absence of the laser or in the absence of V of T, let's see. Okay, so, so we just, first of all, we want to say how do we describe the atomic system? We will describe the wave function as a linear superposition of the energy eigenstates of the system. Th these energy eigenstates, of course, have to obey the Schrodinger equation. Take this as a trial solution, introduce it into the Schrodinger equation, and we find that they have to satisfy the equation H naught on U N of R is equal to E N U N of R. Okay, so okay, so now Let's assume that the laser field is turned on. We want to solve the Schrodinger equation, which I'll then write explicitly as I h bar partial psi of R and T with respect to T is equal to H naught plus V of T times psi of R and T. Now, no one knows to solve, solve this equation, even with the entirely simple uh, case that we're considering here of a monochromatic applied field. Uh, so we're going to have to make a uh, perturbation calculation. So let's assume that the solution has the form psi of R and T is the sum over L of A L of T U L of R e to the minus I omega L T. Uh, Well, now, unpleasantly, we do it. We take this decomposition, we introduce it into the uh, Schrodinger equation of this form here. And what do we find but I h bar sum over L d a l d t 
U L of R e to the minus I omega L T plus I H bar minus I omega L A L of T U L of R e to the minus I omega L T is equal and now the right hand side of the equation sum over L A L of T E L U L of R e to the minus I omega L T so here we made use of the fact that each one of these uh, eigen solutions uh, is, each term is an eigen solution for the unperturbed Hamiltonian and that's how we got this term here. Let me finish the equation and then we'll talk. Uh, and then the last term is sum over L A L of T V U L of R e to the minus I omega L T. Question. Now the second term, term on the left hand side should also be some. Oh, probably. Yeah. Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. So now, let's see, H bar. Omega is just E sub L. So these two terms cancel. Not surprisingly, uh, the, uh, the ones that don't involve the interaction uh, work themselves out automatically. Uh, now we play that trick that we've used several times this semester. Instead of being a sum over all L, we want to extract a single uh, a, a single coefficient uh, uh, out of this term. So we multiply by u m of r star and integrate. over all r, make use of the fact that u m star of r, u l of r, d 3 r is delta m l. So this is a statement that the eigenstates are orthogonal, or I should say the non-degenerate eigenstates are orthogonal. Again, motivating everyone to go home and uh, look up the etymology of the, of the word degenerate. Uh, okay, so let's do that, and we end up with the equation I H bar D A M D T is equal to the sum over L A L of T V M L E to the minus I Omega L M T. Well, I guess I defined omega L M is omega L minus omega M. Oh, but more importantly, we've defined V M L to be integral 
of u m star of r times v times u l of r d three r. Okay, so this is the equation that we have to solve. If we know, if we solve this, we know. Why is it easy to lose the forest for the trees, right? What are we trying to calculate here? Okay, so if this is the ground state and this is the excited state, let's just do single photon absorption. We know that at time t equals zero, a g of t equals zero is equal to one, and a E at t equals zero is equal to zero. And we want to know for time t greater than zero, what is a sub e of t? A sub e is the probability amplitude to be in the excited state. So, that, so that's, how we, that's how we formulate the problem. We want to know what is the probability that the atom has been promoted to the excited state at some future time. And you look at this equation and say, hey, hey, I think this will work. This tells you the time rate of change of the coefficients uh, a sub m. So once we s succeed in solving this equation, which we'll have to do using a perturbation assumption, we, we, we can then immediately solve the question at hand. Okay, so I think I will stop here. Uh, I have to be out of town the rest of the week. So if anybody has questions, feel free to email me. Or, or, or of course, uh, talk to Fred. Uh, I'm going to talk to Fred, who's, uh, whose job it is <laughs> to, <laughs> to answer your questions. Yes? Uh, will you give us uh, the old exam? I did, didn't I? Yes, yeah. you did. Okay. 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 If you didn't, okay. if you didn't you. you've got... Uh, yes, yeah, so from... From, uh, from uh, Akbar. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. No, Ak Akbar sent it. Uh, so... Uh, oh, I got that. Yeah, okay. So, so uh, when your student volunteers to do something for you, <laughs> would you say no? <laughs> he said, do you want me to take care of this? I said, well, yeah, yeah why not? Okay, so I need, to, uh, I need to leave by the rules. It's easier.